Good morning, everyone. Welcome to reInvent on our first day. And I'm glad we get to spend it talking about the intersection of media and entertainment and sustainability, which is my favorite talk topic to talk about. So I'm glad I get to do it here. And in order to put the mindset for this session in your head, I've got three questions. If you can just think about these, it'll put you in the right mindset for the session. And so one is, how many of you feel uncertain about the impacts that climate change is going to have on our society? And then second question would be, how many of you would like to be able to feel more confident in speaking about how sustainability relates to media and the media industry? And then the third topic would be, how many of you would like to be able to say or feel that you're doing your part in order to make a difference? And with that mindset, uh, hello, my name is Jason O'Malley. I'm a senior partner solutions architect here at AWS. And I'm a member of our environmental sustainability and media and entertainment technical field communities. We also have a media and entertainment sustainability working group I'm a core member of. And so I'm really excited to be here. I'm also really excited that we have the European League of Football and Jelko, the CEO, here today. Uh, they have an amazing story. They are an American style football league that's based in Europe. They started just three years ago. And this year, they made the bold decision to switch to a model in which they produce the majority of their games using a remote live cloud production workflow. So I'm really excited to talk about that, especially because this workflow was actually recognized by Sports Video Group Europe earlier this month for a Sports Broadcasting Achievement Award. So we're gonna deep dive into the architecture. And I've also got my colleague Felix here. Felix is a solutions architect that has been working with the European League of Football this entire year as they've gone on this journey. So without further ado, let's dive in. So our session today, first part, I'm gonna cover the topic of sustainability as it relates to AWS. And then we'll talk a little bit about how does sustainability relate to the media and entertainment industry. And then I'll bring those back together and talk about how does that relate to live cloud production. And then Jelko will come up and talk about the founding story of the European League of Football and talk about how they came to the decision to migrate their workloads to doing the live cloud production on AWS this season. And finally, Felix will do a deep dive into the AWS architecture that made this achievement possible. So we're here today, we're at reInvent, and we're talking about the critical issue of climate change. Now, many of us, you've seen the headlines, some people may have read the reports. Some people may have seen some of the impacts of climate change firsthand. And so what becomes apparent when you read the reports is that in order to attain the type of carbon reductions that'll be necessary in order to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change is it's gonna require both cross government but then also cross industry effort in order to find inventive ways to rethink the way we do our businesses, usual processes across the board and remove carbon footprint from our processes. And so one of the ways that Amazon is thinking and working about on the issue of climate change is with the Climate Pledge. So Amazon co-founded and was the first signatory of the Climate Pledge back in September 2019. And this is a pledge to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. And one of the things Amazon does as well is work with other companies that would like to uh, achieve the same goal as well and to welcome them in. And so to date, we've had over 400 companies and some of those even in media and entertainment that have joined and signed the Climate Pledge. And the only areas of action that a company would need to agree to is regular reporting, uh, carbon elimination, and then credible offsets. So if these sound like goals that align with your organization, then you can find out more information about joining on the Climate Pledge website, and we'll have a QR code for that at the end of the session. So now we'll talk about media and entertainment and the carbon footprint in the media and entertainment industry. So overall, increasing number of media and entertainment companies have begun reporting on their carbon emissions in some form, their greenhouse gas or GHG emissions. And so this increase in reporting has also driven an increased awareness about what's actually in the content of those reports, and then also what's the impact, the environmental impact of an organization's carbon footprint. And so GHG protocol, doing a quick, quick recap of that, 
GHG protocol is the predominant global standard for reporting GHG emissions. And if you're reporting GHG emissions, you're going to report in scope one, two, or three. And so if we look at this through the lens of media and entertainment, scope one emissions, these are gonna be emissions that are direct emissions from the organization that are owned and controlled by the organization. So an example would be in media, if you have an outside broadcast truck and the emissions coming out of that tailpipe, that would be scope one, or the natural gas that's utilized in order to heat your owned and operated facility. A scope two emission, these are emissions that come from indirect emissions from the purchase of electricity, steam, heat, or cooling. Now in the context of media, this is primarily gonna be electricity to power things like our cameras, our lights, and our server infrastructure. And then finally, scope three, these again are indirect emissions, and these are from assets and activities that are not directly controlled by the reporting organization, but that the organization indirectly impacts as part of its value chain. And so this can relate to uh, goods and services that the company purchases. And one that I'm gonna call out specifically for this session is that scope three will include business travel. And so that'll be related, and so we'll think back to that later. And so when we're preparing for this talk, we were trying to think about what's the current state of the media industry. And so we did a relatively simple exercise where we took 10 significant media companies, downloaded the reports, and then averaged out that percentage of scope one, scope two, and scope three as a percentage of total. So what we found when we averaged that out is that across those 10 companies, scope one was around 4%. Again, those are those direct emissions. Scope two, on average, was about 5%. Again, that's from primarily purchased electricity. And then scope three, which again includes things such as business travel, was 91%. And so if we're looking for where within media is the area in which we can target for the biggest impact, scope three is gonna be a prime target. And so this aligns within the media industry as well. So some people here may be familiar with Albert. Albert is a group that focuses on the environmental sustainability of film and TV production. And so they produce reports, and one of the reports that they produced in the Albert Annual Review of 2021 found that travel remains the largest part of a production's carbon footprint. And then the report then goes on to say that if you're able to reduce travel or change travel of any kind, that will also help in impact or reduce your overall carbon footprint. So it's important to think about this on two levels. Now on one level, you can think about it on your individual production or organization level, but it's also important to think about it collectively as an industry. And if this is the largest part of production's carbon footprint, then what can we as an industry do in order to re reduce our impact? And so I'll give you a, a bit of a comparison. So a lot of folks that work in production will be familiar with the concept of a production budget, which is the total amount of money that you can spend and you don't want to go over that budget. Well, within environmental sustainability, scientists have come up with the concept of a carbon budget. And so a carbon budget is the total amount of carbon dioxide equivalents that can be emitted into the atmosphere until scientists predict we will hit those one and a half or two degrees temperature rises and receive even worse impacts from climate change. So in short, any meaningful reduction of our carbon footprint will help impact that bigger issue. Now, move into talking about how do we at AWS think about sustainability. So we break it down into three categories. We break it into sustainability of the cloud, in the cloud, and through the cloud. So sustainability of the cloud, this relates to the sustainability efforts of our data centers and our cloud operations. And what this comes down to is that AWS's scale allows us to achieve a higher resource utilization than is gonna be possible than the average on-premises data center. And so we've had international research firm, 451 Research, which is a part of S&P Global Intelligence. They've run multiple reports across multiple different geographies. And what they found is that when you migrate a workload from on-premises to AWS, you can save a carbon footprint of nearly 80%. What it also found was that within the US, AWS is 3.6 times more energy efficient than the median enterprise data center surveyed, and that number is five times more energy efficient for the average enterprise data center surveyed in Europe. And this also relates to Amazon is the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy globally, and we have a goal 
at Amazon to be powering our operations with 100% renewable energy by 2030, and we're on pace to hit that goal five years early by 2025. And then related back to AWS, as of 2022, we have 19 AWS regions that are powered with energy that's attributable to 100% renewable energy, and that includes all of the available regions within the US, Canada, and Europe. And then, so now that's sustainability of the cloud. And then if we shift to sustainability in the cloud, sustainability in the cloud is a continuous effort that's really focused on the energy efficiency and the carbon footprint reduction of your actual AWS environment. And this is continuous effort. And one of the resources we have that supports our customers with this is our well-architected framework for sustainability and the sustainability pillar. So this pillar, it's a white paper. It contains best practices, operational guidance, and uh, design principles that help you optimize and achieve your sustainability goals on AWS. And a couple of the best practices that we can borrow and then look through the lens of media are fundamental things. So one of the fundamentals is just right-sizing your workload. So say you have a video mixer workload, you're running it on an Amazon EC2 instance, what you do is you right size it, you find out what are those computational requirements needed to achieve you know, running that application successfully, and you right size it so you're not wasting extra CPU cycles and otherwise. And then it also relates to, another example could be, say you're producing live sports events on the weekend and you have on-demand resources. Well then just shutting those resources off during the middle of the week, then that can also help reduce your AWS carbon footprint. And then finally, sustainability through the cloud. Now this is different. This is when you actually utilize AWS to transform and to achieve an outcome related to sustainability that's outside of the cloud. And so this is where we're gonna be focusing our section on here today. So diving in, sustainability through the cloud, emphasizing that the first two that I mentioned, the of and in the cloud, are really about optimizing the IT efficiency of those components, the energy efficiency of the components, then sustainability through the cloud allows you to transform the way you do your business as usual operations. And so we're gonna take a look at a use case of a through the cloud use case, which is live cloud production, which allows you to produce live events through the cloud. So before doing that, level set on live production in like, you know, a high level view of it. And so if we take sports as an example, with live production, you're gonna have your cameras, you've got a stadium, You've got your video and audio feeds. And then those route back to components like a video mixer, audio mixer, graphics replay machines. And then typically, the legacy way of doing this would be those would commonly be housed on site within an outside broadcast truck or an OB truck, which you see on the bottom corner there. And so an OB truck, as you can see, it's a large truck. And the reason it's large is it not only has to house that specialized video equipment, like the video mixer and the audio mixer, but also the operators of that equipment as well. So now we'll shift, if we shift into live cloud production, you'll see it's got the same functional components. So we still have our video mixer, we've got our audio mixer, we've got our graphics and a replay machine, but they're virtualized. They're running on software, running on an Amazon EC2 instance, for example, and, but the same functional components are there. And what the difference is, so now you have your video mixer, say it's running on an Amazon EC2 instance, that's running in an AWS data center. Well, now you have an operator, instead of being there on site controlling it, they're remotely controlling that machine, but the machine's in the AWS data center. Now, this can happen in a couple ways. In the case of the European League of Football, they actually have the group co-located together in the same facility, all remotely producing the game. But it also opens up the possibility that those operators could work from the comfort of their home, which is something that our industry saw a lot of, especially during the most challenging times of the COVID-19 pandemic. And because this can be a little abstract, there was a time when I uh, hadn't done this before I actually did it in real life. And because it's a bit abstract, you may have a vision of, I understand how live production works, I've seen that, I've known that for years or decades, but the concept of live cloud production might be a bit abstract. And so, what I've done is we pulled together a few behind the scenes examples from the European League of Football. And so what you'll see is you're gonna see those same similar hallmarks. You're gonna see the multi-view, your video, your audio mixer, those are all still functionally there. One thing that is different is if you look at the bottom right-hand corner and you look at the transporter van. 
So that's an example of the transporter van that the European League of Football utilizes in order to bring the still required gear to site. What you notice about it is it's smaller. And one of the reasons it's smaller is that you no longer need to transport the video mixers, the audio mixers to site, and the operators that would normally work out of the outside broadcast truck no longer need to work out of that because they're working back from the remote location. So it allows you to also adopt a more efficient vehicle type there. And so now, stepping back, we're sort of in that micro view. So if we step back and look at a macro view of how these two workflows compare with each other, you see on the top, we've got our stadium, we've got our outside broadcast truck, and then we've got our production crew. And then it's common within the industry to have our production crew fly to site just due to production timelines and distances. But now if we compare to live cloud production, we'll see what's similar and what's different. So similar, same is the stadium, the cameras, that stays the same. But what starts to change is you start to have the opportunity to shift to that smaller transport vehicle. Doesn't need to transport as much gear. Maybe you utilize a fly pack in order to ship the required video encoders that you still need on site. And there's still gonna be some people that travel to site. There's still gonna be some on-site production crew in order to hook up those video encoders, set up the video cameras. But where it starts to deviate is then you now are utilizing AWS to host those uh, virtual instances in order to run the production. And by running in AWS, not only are you gaining advantages of the scalability and flexibility that just come naturally from running in AWS, but you also gain some of the benefits I mentioned earlier, which is the carbon efficiency and the renewable energy benefits that we mentioned as well from that sustainability of the cloud aspect. But most impactfully, and looping back to our point about Albert, is this can allow an entire class of people to no longer have that requirement to travel entirely. And with Albert saying that travel remains the largest part of a production's carbon footprint, this is really our target area of rethinking the way we're doing business such that now that group of people no longer needs to travel to site. And if we think about air travel in particular, air travel has a high carbon intensity factor and happens to be one of the easier modes of travel to estimate, which we'll go into here. And so here as I wrap up my set part of the section today, I'm hoping this can inspire you a little bit about looking at the way that if we rethink our workloads, rethink the way we're doing our business as usual, we can start to have a big impact. And so here's a very basic way of calculating and estimating just your avoided emissions from air travel if you were to go about this workflow. So what do you do? You take total number of people no longer traveling, you multiply that by a carbon intensity factor. And that sounds complicated, but there's lots of free calculators online that are trusted sources, and what you can do is input your source and your destination of where you're flying to. You get an a carbon intensity for that mode of travel. You take that amount that you just calculated, and then you multiply it by the total number of games that you're gonna repeat that for, and what you come out with is an estimated amount of avoided emissions that you've saved thanks to switching to this workflow. Now, just to put some, some placeholder numbers in here, these aren't the actual numbers from the European League of Football, ju but just to give you an idea of what that would look like. So you say you had five people, like your technical director, your audio engineer, maybe they're no longer traveling, and then you multiply that by a carbon intensity factor. So here's an example of one from a flight within Europe, and it's 0.127 metric tons of CO2 for a round trip flight. And then multiply that by total number of games. Now, I will say for the carbon intensity factor, it's gonna change from destination, a longer destination is gonna have a bigger carbon intensity factor, but for the sake of this example, we'll keep it static. Multiply it by the total number of games, and then what you come up with is 28.6 metric tons of CO2 avoided. Now to put that number in context, the International Energy Agency has gone through and averaged out what's the average carbon footprint from energy for people that live on Earth, human beings that live on Earth, individuals like me, you, and the number they came up with when they averaged it out across the whole world was 4.7 metric tons of CO2 per year. So you can see from this example, that's per year, and with this small change, you can start to see the size of impact that we can have. And so I think if you apply this type of thinking towards your workflow and your different types of, you apply it towards live cloud production, but also you apply this type of thinking towards other parts of your business that may be carbon intensive, and you can start to see how our industry can start to do our part 
in order to stay within that carbon budget. And so the realization of that estimated carbon footprint was exactly what the European League of Football discovered this year when they switched to live cloud production. And so to tell you more, I'm very excited to welcome Jelko, their CEO, to the stage. We'll tell you more after we watch a quick one minute highlight from the league's 2023 season. Get off. And please give Jelko a round of applause as well. Thank you all. Hey, Frank, one family out here, right? Ball out, baby. It's time to make a name for yourself. We just started. We just started. Let's go! Understand what is going on here. Here he goes. Ooh, that pass is intercepted. Catch is made. He's taken down. We can go the distance. Outside. Touchdown. So, yes, thank you for having me here. Um, normally, I would uh, think you expect somebody standing up front here and talking about soccer and not about American football coming from Germany. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about American football because uh, we say it's the next big thing in Europe and especially in Germany uh, is the biggest market. And uh, uh, what happened over the last 10 years um, is that uh, American football um, came up from a niche sport to, to a major sport in Europe. So when I was working at TV station, the biggest TV station in Germany, we only showed the Super Bowl a year and everybody was complaining, why do we show this? Nobody's interested in American football. Anyhow, we don't understand the rules and why did we, did we show that? Soccer is much more interesting, although we play 90 minutes and at the end it's 0-0 zero, zero and everybody's excited. Uh, this was something that uh, no American ever understood, but uh, uh, that's how the world was running. But when I left POSIBEN, we showed over 150 hours of live coverage of the NFL in German TV. And now it's the second most important sport in Germany. Uh, you may know that um, the NFL had two games this year in Frankfurt. And uh, if uh, we would have the capacity in the stadium, they would have sold more than 3 million tickets overall uh, for these two games. So packed. It's, it's amazing what is happening overall. And that was the reason why we said, okay, maybe um, there is also some kind of headroom uh, with American football to do their own league and not only from the amateur status uh, view, but also thinking about a more professional league. And that was uh, the reason why we started with the European League of Football in the middle of COVID 2021. Um, and uh, yes, started uh, in 21 with eight teams from three nations. So it looked like a small European league, uh, but uh, mainly driven by Germany. In 22, uh, we expanded uh, to, uh, to five countries. And last year, we finished the season with 16 teams from nine countries. So overall, we would say it's a real European league. And uh, as you see here, um, we had uh, a record-breaking attendance with 32,500 uh, people in Hamburg for one regular season game in American football in Germany. We played in the soccer stadium of uh, the HSV, so things are becoming big. Uh, but also uh, what is becoming big as well is um, that we have to think about uh, what was mentioned about traveling more games. We started with 43 games in the first season, had 70 games in the second season and last season close to 100 games. So the things become more and more complicated. And uh, yeah, you have to think about production and the way of production, especially um, when, you're, when you're getting bigger. So um, when we just, uh, just as a short view over what, what we are doing. So um, when, we, when we talk about emotions and, and fans in Europe, over 100 million people, uh, are more or less now dedicated American football fans. It's not as big as in America, but uh, we, are, we are improving and it's becoming bigger and bigger. As I said, second most TV sports uh, at the moment. So 
this is something we have to take care of because people compare us uh, with the NFL or college football. So also from the production standpoint, and this is what we always should have in mind. Uh, one big thing is um, it's compared to soccer, it's a family sport. So, you know, maybe you saw the pictures from Germany, from other countries uh, through Europe. So you have a lot of things with, on the one hand, fans, on the other side, hooligans. Uh, this is something that is, that is not, uh, not a fact in American football. So families are coming in, they're celebrating, they have fun together and spending up to seven, eight hours uh, during one game um, in, a, in a stadium. And uh, we, we are diverse, uh, we have players from 45 nations playing uh, in our league. And, <clears throat> and um, we are doing do more and more live experience, so live games, as I said. Um, we, although we are a young league, uh, we are running uh, betting business, so data and statistics is uh, really important for us when we are producing. We have our own OTT platform running our own Game Pass that is available throughout the whole world. So uh, from, the, from, the, from the production standpoint, we have to be professional in every way um, and uh, be sustainable in the future uh, with all the production of our content. Um, you see, once again, um, as we started uh, small, and uh, but we are thinking about 25, maybe even 26. The, the goal that we have is to be present uh, with 24 teams through at least 15 European nations, and with that covering more or less uh, half a billion of people uh, with uh, franchises in these countries where we are. Where we are. So this would mean, as you see, a lot of. Uh, producing a lot of traveling around, so we will have at least at the end 160, maybe even 200 games at the end. So um, it's all about production and uh, traveling through Europe. And uh, this said, um, our starting point from the second to the third season was, okay, we are becoming bigger, we have to produce more, we have to be more on-site, traveling, traffic, it's summertime, holidays, people are uh, traveling all over the world and all of a sudden then we are also traveling with 10, 15 people uh, next to the teams, uh, to the pitches. So this was a point where we said, okay, we have maybe to, uh, to do a break and to rethink um, if we want to produce the same way the other leagues produce over the last 50 years. And as we are young, uh, I thought, okay, uh, maybe it's a good idea. Um, um, as we think that we are innovative on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, we are young. So if we do some mistakes in the beginning, maybe it's not that hard, uh, like for a league that exists uh, over years. So, and this was the reason why we said, okay, how can we do this? Uh, how, we can, how can we do remote production? And then who is uh, technically capable of implementing this? And uh, as I said, we are a startup, so uh, innovation means sometimes being fast and, and rethinking. And uh, uh, after planning of three, four months with the other things that we have in mind, so we said, okay, we want to change it all of a sudden. So at the end, we had it eight weeks before the start of our league in the June this year, who is able to do this within eight weeks preparation time. Um, yes, and also thinking from now is who's capable to do this, let's say, also the next steps with us, integrating data, health uh, um, things uh, into the feed, uh, into the production. So um, be sustainable also the future and not only a lucky shot for one season and then coming back to the old way of production. And for sure, again, startups, so we are not the NFL or even not the DFL from Germany, from soccer, so we have to take care about costs, we have to be cost effective. So that was also thinking, okay, who can help us? And this was, at the end, uh, the reason why we said, okay, we want to partner with AWS. Um, we want them to become our partner in order uh, to start in 23 with this kind of remote production, but also be able to grow with them together in the future. This is uh, a chart that I love most. It looks so easy, it looks so sweet, and, uh, but it means so much sweat. Uh, over the season, so I'm happy that I don't have to explain this. This will be Felix's uh, uh, part. But one thing is, uh, we had uh, we had this season sometimes four parallel games from four different countries. So we got 28, 30 uh, signals at the same times into our headquarter in Munich, and uh, 
As Jason said, we were, we were to mix audio, video, graphics, uh, put in live commentary. We sometimes show the games with four different languages as we are the European League and not everybody is speaking English. Um, so to mix it with, uh, with different languages and then distribute it the normal way or the different ways uh, that are possible. So um, because uh, although we are talking about remote production and everything, um, the one thing the customer outside doesn't care about remote or SNG or whatever, he just uh, is taking care about is the quality good enough uh, and is this what I'm receiving at home, that what I'm paying for. So, and as I said, this is my Swedish chart and uh, um, I think uh, Felix will explain later how it worked, but one thing is uh, we made it happen this year and uh, this is uh, uh, what I was at the end proud of uh, that we did it. So, um, and the reason why I did it is uh, we had access to a technology that a startup like us never would have on its own. So this is, uh, we, we, we couldn't allow us, but uh, you, working with AWS together, uh, make this happen. So, and, uh, and what was really important at the uh, very beginning is I jump over to the learnings is uh, we only had eight weeks, as I said, but uh, you have to have a dedicated team that is working on that because it's totally different than producing the normal way. Because uh, I would say uh, if you have a lack of time that we had, then communication is all. And at the same time, the communication is the biggest issue that you have because uh, if you're doing something remote, but you're not that stuck in, in the live production, so if things delay for five minutes, it's not a problem. But if you have a TV partner who is expecting you uh, on fr to be on frame uh, live on his TV screen and you have to say, oh, I have to delete for, or delay for five minutes, it's a big, big issue. So um, communicating on the pitches, on four different pitches in four different countries, maybe sometimes in different languages, because that's, it's, not, it's, it's not US, it's so sometimes you have Austrians and you may think they speak German, but it's not always the way. Uh, it's kind of dialect of German and it's sometimes more difficult than speaking Spanish. And um, so um, you have to talk in different, uh, in different languages with the people um, on the pitch and it must be real time. So because you put in the graphics and uh, data and everything in real time. So you must know exactly within frames what is happening next because you put in a graphic and imagine you think it's a total, but all of a sudden it's a close-up, so it works like amateurs uh, working on a pitch if, you don't, uh, if you're not able to, um, to put it together. So <clears throat> at the end, we made close to 70 games from 99 this season by remote, and uh, I would even say, although it was an adventure, but at the end, uh, we even improved the quality um, of that what we have shown to the people, especially through our Game Pass, because we put in um, more data, statistics to the feed, and we also had a multi-camera uh, view that was allowed, so you, was not, you were not only able to watch a game on one mixed feed, you were also able to watch maybe from four different camera perspectives at the same time and simultaneously. Um, what was a great reason for the people to pay the 100 euros for the season pass overall. And at the end, uh, we sit here, we saved more than 40 tons of carbon um, this season. So um, I would say, and this was the reason also uh, to work together, um, this is not the end, it's just the beginning. So as I said, we want, we want to become bigger. We want to play in 15 countries through Europe. We want to play 160 to 200 games a year. So uh, we want to be more innovative than uh, another league um, in Europe overall. So we have to optimize a lot of things and uh, implementing the learnings uh, that we had over this season. Um, all matches must be produced. Also the top matches that we called uh, from TV side this year, uh, we didn't produce by remote because the TV uh, station said, mm, we, we don't want it, it's, it's, it's too difficult and we don't believe this will work out. So, now uh, we have to build trust with this kind of production that also that the big TV channels say, okay, this is a way of production that we are accepting and uh, that you are allowed also to deliver us the signals via remote production. Data, statistics, betting, everything is becoming more and more important. So again, putting into feeds real time and implementing this into the feeds is one, one big thing. And uh, 
we see here second screen application, our app and everything. You know this stuff uh, by the, let's say, normal production. So what we, that's what we're doing also. But we have to put it everything together in this kind of environment of pro production. And again, also, one thing is American football. It's the same in Europe like here in America. It's uh, athlete health. How can we use uh, sensors and everything with, the, with data feeds in order to improve uh, uh, the athlete health is one topic that we are facing. So, and uh, last but not least from my side, um, one big thing is, and uh, this is something that we worked on after we made uh, the pictures happen, so is uh, from our point, um, if we want to earn more money, if we want to um, be more effective, so uh, we need more data-driven business, and uh, this is where the profit will lie in the future. So thinking about remote production, working together with a cloud system, uh, the things with data, how to put everything together, how to implement this, and uh, at the end, how to capitalize is one big thing, not only for us, but also for the other leagues. Um, I'm 100% sure that uh, although we are maybe at the moment the first one, but the most uh, <clears throat> small leagues, niche leagues will follow because I think it's the only way to produce in future cost effective and uh, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint uh, if people think serious about the thing. And, uh, and in the end, I think uh, it's also on us because the quality is even improving. And I, I, I really think even for the people that are traveling normally uh, to the pitches, uh, it's more convenient uh, to stay in Munich and to work from there than traveling in 24 hours to Barcelona, stuck in traffic and coming back, producing carbon. So I think uh, um, overall it's, it's a benefit also for them. Yes. That's from my side. Thank you very much for listening. If, uh, it was a short overview over, over the ELF. Um, yeah, maybe next time a little bit more. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome at WeInvent. So my name is Felix Wegner. I'm a solution architect at Amazon Web Services. And during the last year, I accompanied the European League of Football when they were building their live cloud production pipeline. So I'm very interested and I'm very excited to join today's session because it actually takes us on a very special journey. So it started with Jason telling us about the essentials, how we can actually use technology to build a more sustainable business. He explained us how we can actually use the concepts of sustainability off, in and through the cloud and therefore gave us this feeling like, oh now I start understanding and I start seeing the opportunity for sustainability. And then the journey went ahead with Chalco coming on stage with music, bringing in some emotions, giving us some action, and actually showing us in a very impressive real-world example what's possible if we think big for sustainability. And with that, we actually arrive here, right now, right here, because now we have the feeling, yeah, I want to go for it, I want to do this, so I have to understand how it's actually built. And that's exactly the third part of the session, telling us, hey, how does the architecture, architecture look like and what are the building blocks I can rely on? To get us started, I actually brought you a high-level timeline of the project. And on the very left side of the slide, you can see the starting point. So the starting point was mid of April when we had our on-site visit at ELF headquarters and we initially communicated about the idea of a live cloud production platform. And if you look at the right side of the slide, you see the end point, which is the first weekend of June. Because there, there's the first day, there's the first match day of the 2023 season. And now you immediately do the math and you notice from the start point to the end point, it's seven to eight weeks, which is an incredible ambitious timeline. And on top of that, you have to see the conditions of this project. This is something we built from scratch new. It's something we haven't done like 2000 times before, so we cannot really rely on routines. And on top of that, it's highly visible. So, People are going to watch us, so we definitely want to be successful with that. So overall, if you put all these conditions in a nutshell, we have to understand how we can actually de-risk this project while accelerating it. And that's a super important thing because it's highly influenced by the way we build our architecture. So let's look into it. What you see on the slide is a high-level overview of the architecture of the ELF's live cloud production pipeline. It starts on the very left with the signal production, so that really happens on site. You, get to, you go to the stadium, you take your cameras, and you produce your signal. And then the next step is to think about a way how you can actually transfer that signal from the stadium into the cloud. 
And once you've done that, you become operational because then you signal, you do the signal processing, you add the audio, you do your feed distribution. And of course, while all doing that, you also build a virtual control room and you take care of the data management. So what we're actually going to do on the next slides is taking all of these elements and look what's remarkable and what patterns we can use to be successful like ELF was. So let's start with the signal production. What you actually have to understand to really cross the point of signal production is what stadiums we're using here. So what we are not using is the stadium that you see when we build or when we watch the Super Bowl. So this is not a 100K people stadium, state-of-the-art, top-notch infrastructure. Instead, we have solid stadiums, but we have to think about ways how we get our signal from the stadium to the cloud. So that's the key question here. And the solution for us to do that is actually to rely on 5G transmission. So we rely on mobile networking, and we actually do that with two LU800 units from LiveView. So why is that important? Because it allows us to decouple signal production, signal transmission from the stadium. So we are limited, eliminating our limiting aspect of the infrastructure on site, and we are becoming operational in the cloud. So 5G for us means a gateway which is flexible and adaptable and makes us operational. And with that, we move into the cloud, which allows us to use the state-of-the-art technology, the scale, and also the sustainability of our operations. Talking about sustainability, Jason introduced the concepts of off, in, and through the cloud. What we look here is off and in the cloud. So sustainability of the cloud for ELF means that we use dedicated instance types. So for example, for signal ingestion, we have instant types with highly efficient network throughput. While for example, for signal processing, we use instant types which are built for graphic intense workloads. And with that, we have the chance to run those workloads highly efficient. And we are not only running them workload specific with high efficiency, we also run them in the Frankfurt region for the ELF. And the Frankfurt region is also one of the regions Jason's mentions, which power consumption is actually attributable to 100% renewable energy. From there, moving on to sustainability in the cloud. And if we want to have understand the sustainability in the cloud, we have to look at the ELF schedule. Because like Jason and Chalko mentioned, Football actually happens on the weekend. So how great would it be if you, whatever you build here, you can turn it off from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because you don't need it, it's nothing happening, and ramp it up for the weekend. So that's exactly what ELF does. They ramp it up on, let's say, Friday evening, get ready for the weekend, produce Saturday and Sunday, and ramp it down on Sunday evening, Monday morning after the post-processing. And with that, it's not only about computation, but we can also go one step further, which is about storage. So, for example, in the case of ELF, we use S3 lifecycle policies, which allows us to refer to very efficient storage policies. Staying a little bit with those building blocks around signal ingestion and signal processing. A very remarkable aspect of this architecture is actually third-party integrations. You see a bunch of the most important partners, and let me, be, let me be crystal clear with that. Without partners and without the ecosystem around AWS, this ambitious timeline and this highly complex project would never have been realizable. So an incredible job of our partners. Thank you very much. I saw some faces here, so thank you. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Besides that, there are also two main reasons why we actually use third-party integrations. And the first one is that it gives you a lot of speed. So instead of building everything by yourself manually from scratch, you can take off-the-shelf solutions from your partners and integrate them seamlessly. And with that, you gain a lot of speed, which for example allows you to build a virtual control room within seven weeks. So this is exactly what Jason referred to. This is the virtual control room of ELF close to Munich. And it shows you exactly what happens when you virtualize your hardware. So for example, here you see the audio mixer during a match day. The second aspect why we use third party integrations is actually because it de-risks your project. First one, on the technical aspect. So by referring well-established industry solutions, you gain confidence, you gain routine. So you, those are well-established, well-trained, well-validated. The second aspect is actually maybe even more important because it's the human aspect. 
Live cloud production and the introduction of live cloud production is a kind of transformation for your operations. It's not as easy, so you have to take care of the human node about it. And that's a great thing about third party integrations because let's think about the operators. They were maybe running with RT previously. They don't even notice if they do it remote or in the cloud. The only thing they notice, hey, this is actually the same program I'm used to, the same tool I'm used to work with, so I'm actually not afraid of this transition. I can rely on routines, I can work as I'm used to it, so it gives me confidence and I let them perform at the best level. With that being said, we're actually not too bad. We are already close to the goal. So we have speed, we have reliability. The only thing we are missing is actually scale. And you heard about Chalco, this, this leak is growing immensely and it's growing rapidly fast. So in the 2023 season, we produced more than 60% of our games remotely. So if you would have to do all of that manually, hand by hand, that would be a lot of work and a lot of complexity. So the solution to cope with that increasing operational complexity is automation. And that's exactly what we did for the feed distribution. So we built a serverless start-stop mechanism for feed distribution based on AWS Elemental Media Services. Looking into that, we actually have the one for the starting the feeds. What we do is we rely on AWS Elemental Con Media Connect to orchestrate our operations. We then use AWS Event Bridge to detect events and to transfer them into actions. We use AWS Lumber to execute those actions. And then we add AWS Elemental Media Live to produce the signal, for example, RTMP. And we actually follow the same mechanism, the same pattern when stopping the feed. So again, we use AWS Elemental Media Connect, use EventBridge to build a decoupled and event-driven architecture, use Lambda, Media Live, and also we are adding Media Convert out of the AWS Media Services to build a flexibility and variety in formats. And we're diving deep into this because it's actually a super important aspect. Why? Because those are managed AWS services. So your producer, your producer, your production company does not have to become an IT company. They can still focus on what they are really good at because they don't have to worry too much about the IT underneath. So instead of giving them a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting, you let them focus on what they are really good at good at, producing highly fan-engaging experiences. And with that, we actually went through the whole architecture from the signal production at the stadium to the automated feed distribution, and we saw how we can build such an architecture in a highly ambitious timeline. Quite a lot of learning, so let us look at the key takeaways. First of all, Chaco already mentioned it. Achieving live cloud production is a huge success, success and gives a lot of opportunities. And that's the point. It's not the end point, it's the starting point. It opens up an incredible big landscape of opportunities because you now have accessibility to technology you probably never seen before. The second thing, with all those opportunities, you have to take decisions. And you're moving fast, so you have to take decisions fast. In order to achieve the best outcome on those decisions, you have one guiding principle, and that guiding principle is to be fan-centric. So whenever you have to take a decision, ask yourself what's best for the fan, what's best for the broadcaster, what's best for the customer, and then work backwards from that. That highly in increases the chances of taking the right decisions. And last but not least, and this is important for the session today, that we have to do a shift in mindset. So historically, we might be thinking of economics, performance, and sustainability as a trade-off. Right? If I want to be performant, it might cost me a lot. If I want to be sustainable, I might have a decrease in performance. We have to change that mindset because on the case of ELF, we actually see that you can have all of that. And you can ha have all of that at the same time as they are complementing each other. The only thing we have to do is to use technology wisely. And with that learning and with that change of mindset, we get some extra motivation and talking about motivation, we arrive at the most important slide of today, which is the call to action. So Jason, Shalko, and me actually want you to do three things. The first one is realize easy wins by leveraging the sustainability of and in the cloud. Those are concepts introduced by Jason, and you can realize those easy wins by talking to your account manager and saying, hey, dear account manager, I want to have a well-architected review with a focus on sustainability. That's a super direct way and a super accessible way to make your first impact. 
So our ask is to schedule a well-architected review in Q1 2024 with your AWS account manager, focusing on sustainability. If you've done that, you actually had a great start because you improved the sustainability of your IT and your IT landscape. But we want you to go further. We want you to use the sustainability through the cloud to be bold enough to reinvent the sustainability of your business. So have a really nice week at weekend at reInvent. And after that, you go back home, take your roadmap for 2024, and ask yourself, in this roadmap for 2024, where are we actually using technology to build a more sustainable business? We want is not an acceptable answer, but I think with your motivation and all your learnings and all your inspiration, we will find plenty of opportunities to transfer this knowledge into the, your roadmap for 2024. And the last thing is, when you're going to do that, remember you're not alone. So this is about sustainability. We are in this together, and we're going to solve it together. So let's start solving it together right now. Thank you very much. We brought you some extra resources, so you can access them via the QR codes, for example, the well-architected framework on the sustainability pillar. And also, we appreciate very much your feedback via the app. Thank you very much.